let's uh, resume and continue with um, uh, we ha we have uh, our last part part of this conference with uh, a keynote uh, by Bojana Piscu. Is like that? Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's great. <laughs> and so we are. I'm very happy to introduce her because uh, uh, I was so fascinated about the exhibitions you created, and it is something that we have. A, it was on on the air all the time. The question of the non-aligned movement, but right now we have the moment with Boyana that she curated uh, the exhibition. Uh, Southern Constellations, the Poetics of the Non-Aligned. So we couldn't imagine <laughs> a better uh, keynote for, for this moment. And so I will introduce you to her. She's graduated in art history from the University of Ljubljana and PhD from uh, the Institute for Art History and the Charles University in Prague. And she works at the Moderna Galleria and... Uh, for 20 years. Twen ooh, 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> so... <laughs> and you work for a long... For, for is, is, this is a, a long project because we met and the Call Atlantic Conference with the organizer, the Reina Sofia, and you were talking about the non-aligned uh, politics. Ten years. Yes, and now, the, now this is the exhibition <laughs> and we thought <laughs> it was important to have also the approach from curating, a, a curating perspective, research and curating, curating practice. Practices. So uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Thank you for being here in Grenoble. And you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula and Sonia and all the organizers. It has been a very nice two-day uh, uh, lectures, meetings, discussions. And I have to say that this will not be an academic text. I'm not an academic. I work as curator, as Paula mentioned. I do researches, and mostly I do exhibitions. So it will be, uh, part will be a research, uh, and uh, also presentation of the exhibition Southern Constellation. But um, before I go into the exhibition, I have to tell you a little bit about the context, a little bit about the background, because uh, it's important where I'm from also for the non-aligned movement research. And I was born in Yugoslavia, and this is the country that does not exist anymore. <laughs> um, Socialist Yugoslavia, because we had one Yugoslavia before Socialist Yugoslavia. So Socialist Yugoslavia was established in 1945, so after the Second World War, and it disintegrated in, 19, uh, in the 90s during the so-called Yugoslav Wars. And as you can see here on this very beautiful image from Children Encyclopedia, um, it was a country of six republics, 26 ethnic groups, three religions, three official languages, two alphabets. And today we have out of this uh, seven countries. So politically speaking, Yugoslavia was quite different from the rest of Eastern Europe. It was never a part of the Warsaw Pact. And in uh, 1948, <coughs> Yugoslavia had this breakup with Stalin, with Soviet Union. So after that year, it pursued its own independent socialist path. Uh, and it was not a totalitarian state. And this is important to emphasize in the light of current historical revisionism in our country, in our region, in our former country. But this is, of course, a very huge topic, and it's not for today's discussion. So the non-aligned movement. Um, first of all, I will say what the non-aligned movement is not, because I've been at various conferences in the past five years or more. I'm, I've been reading text, and I see uh, various free interpretations of non-aligned movement. So non-aligned movement was not an artistic movement. Uh, Non-aligned movement did not begin with the Bandung Conference in 1955. And various countries of the Warsaw Pact, including Romania and Poland and so on, were not members, were not observers, and were not participants in any way of the non-aligned movement. So, but what the non-aligned movement was, and this all the historical facts tell us, documents tell us, reports tell us, and believe it or not, there are still some people alive who were present at the first conference in 1961 in Belgrade. They have 
around 95 years old, still very much active, but that's the facts. So non-aligned movement was a coalition of small and middle-sized states, and these states were mostly former colonies, not necessarily, and developing countries from the global south or the third world. And Yugoslavia was one of its key members. Um, and it's interesting with Yugoslavia because as you see in this map from the 73 Algeria, it's basically the only European country. There were two more, Malta and Cyprus, but they were they joined later, they were small, they were politically not so important within the movement. Non-aligned movement, so as I said, was formed in 61 at the Belgrade summit with 25 participating countries, as you see in this image here. And this number had grown to almost 100 members in 1979, which was organization speak. The non-aligned movement functioned as a social uh, movement in the international system. It was a third way between two blocks aiming to change the existing global structures and to create more just, equal, and peaceful world order. So it was in, in, in its essence anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-racist movement. The non-aligned movement also represented the first major disruption in the Cold War map. So while Belgrade Summit was uh, mostly Afro-Asian and Yugoslav project, the movement acquired worldwide, worldwide dimension with inclusion of Latin America later on. So this is one image um, from the place where the first conference happened. This is in Belgrade, and this place was built for the purpose of the conference, and it was called um, Palace of Yugoslav Federation. As you see, it's very beautifully designed. Uh, unfortunately, this place, uh, it's not accessible to public any longer. It's now called the Palace of Serbia, and they open it to public every couple of years. So I was lucky to be able to see the interior a couple of years ago. Um, and then here we already have the first project within the exhibition. And that's the project of Museum of Yugoslavia. Museum of Yugoslavia, it's a former museum of revolution. And what they, uh, what are they, they are, why they are important is because they have hundreds of thousands of images in their archives. And these archives are dedicated to, of course, Socialist Yugoslavia, President Tito, non-aligned movement, various diplomatic meetings, and so on. So um, colleagues from Museum of Yugoslavia, they presented uh, images from their archive focusing on the first conference of the non-aligned. I don't know, I hope you can see uh, what it's all, what these images, what these photos are depicting. Um, so how I worked with this exhibition, as I said, this was a part of uh, really long research on the non-aligned movement. Uh, I've worked, uh, so I collaborated with people with, in various institutions, archives, uh, in various collections, also with artists uh, in Yugoslavia and around the world. So um, I was interested at first in a non-aligned movement as a movement, as a political movement, but of course later on I realized I really have to focus because it's wow. So uh, I focused on cultural politics and the role art and culture play within the movement. And the exhibition in a way proposes that the heritage of the non-aligned uh, should be given another chance. So the works, there are 26 cases from around the world and uh, you've heard, uh, you mentioned in your presentation some of them. So Olivia is part of the exhibition, Ospal posters are part of the exhibition, Tercer Mundo, uh, uh, Tercer Mundo project in uh, Cuba is in this exhibition, a project done by uh, Maria Berrios and Jakob Jakobsen and Museo, uh, Museo de la Solidaridad from Santiago is also part of this exhibition among the 26 cases. So the exhibition does not only deal with the past, that is researching or interpreting various historical constellations, as I said, organizations, events, exhibitions, cultural exchanges, cultural politics, but also uh, look into and examine the present time. And this for us was maybe even more important than going into the past. And for us, the question was that was important was, could there be a non-aligned contemporaneity? And if so, 
what would be like. And uh, mm -hmm. our uh, our public program is around this question. So it's uh, workshop, uh, conferences, roundtables, and so on. And also, um, I have to mention, uh, you've been talking a lot about Tricontinental, but there is this uh, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research that is mm -hmm. around Vijay Prashad and his colleagues, and that for us was also an important source for this exhibition. Um, now I go into this particular um, particular research. Can you see this at all, what's written or not really? Okay, so I'll go, I, I thought this was gonna happen, so I prepared, and this one is better, right? So this is uh, cultural and artistic production in Yugoslavia and the relation to the non-aligned movement. What is um, like, uh, um, maybe specific for Yugoslavia, is that between 45, the, this, this period between 1945 and 91, it's usually interpreted uh, and contextualized within the Eastern European art historical narrative. And as you know, those of you who study uh, Eastern European art, this narrative was constructed after 1989, and then it was then that international art world became interested in it. But in Yugoslavia, there existed another story, even though it's been largely forgotten after mm -hmm. the 1990s. So this story that is different from that of Eastern Europe. Uh, I'm talking about the network that was politically constructed and promoted on the basis of Yugoslavia's foreign relations with the third world. Uh, Yugoslavia extensively used its specific geopolitical position in the economic sense and also in culture. And there was a special committee established after the Second World War. It was called the Committee for Cultural Relations with Foreign Countries, which dealt, as the name tells you, with exhibition across Yugoslavia's borders. And uh, interestingly, the chairman of this committee <coughs> was a surrealist writer and artist and politician, Marko Ristic. And Marko Ristic lived and studied in Paris before the Second World War. So the main things within this committee were cultural conventions and programs of cultural cooperation. It included Western uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, and also the countries of the non-aligned movement in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. And this cultural exchanges happened on low levels of cultural production. And this particular research it has been done for the first time, and it was done by a colleague of mine from the museum, from the archival department, Thea Merchar. She spent around two years in various archives. I'm, ta I'm telling you this because you see this is a serious work has been done for this <laughs> exhibition. And she spent around two years in various archives in former Yugoslavia to extract the knowledge about these collaborations. And you see, um, we put this, this was a map that is at the exhibition. There's, we have a catalog and there's more specifically about this collaboration in her text in the catalog. But you see how rich, maybe you can get it, the idea from this image, how rich these collaborations were. And how this worked. Uh, Yugoslavia had a special federal budget. That means this was a state budget. And this budget was meant to prepare exhibitions for those countries. And when these uh, particular agreements were signed, that meant that countries, for example, Congo, Cameroon, Nigeria, Sudan, had to prepare an exhibition in return and send it to Yugoslavia. And because, of course, uh, graphics are very easy and cheap to transport, in many cases, uh, these exhibitions were exhibitions of contemporary prints, also posters, also photos, also architectural maquettes, but there were also uh, dance troupes, uh, theater, etc., etc. And it's very interesting to go uh, into these uh, archives because they were recently declassified. You can find all sorts of discussions there. Also, some. Uh, I wouldn't use the word racist, but maybe uh, a little bit in that way, saying, for example, we are not going to send this contemporary art from Yugoslavia to this country because they do not have uh, developed art infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'll not go into that. Um, but uh, in Yugoslavia, there was, after the Second World War, a specific antagonism because even though in politics we have that, non-aligned movement is the Yugoslav foreign policy and all these ideas about the cultural exchanges with the Third War and so on and so on, but the main orientation in all the museums and the galleries in arts and culture 
was primarily the one following the Western epistemic and art canon. So uh, the departing question for us to answer with this exhibition was also, how did those contacts with other modernities, those cross-fertilization, if I use uh, Senghor's word, how did they affect the cultural landscape in Yugoslavia and what kind of seeds remained from such encounter? Um, okay, so I will skip this part. And to better understand this particular relation between Yugoslavia and the Third World, we would have to go um, say 100 years back in time. There was a growing fascination in Yugoslavia's cultural circles about faraway places already in the late 1920s. However, very few Yugoslavs traveled to exotic, exotic places, mainly because Yugoslavia was not a colonial country and as such had no colonial experience. And in this regard, it shared its anti-colonial consciousness with African and Asian countries. And it's interesting that they were uh, Yugoslav people studying in France that showed a particular interest in Africa. And many of them, as the guy I mentioned before, Marko Ristic, they belong to the surrealist circles, including this guy, um, Rastko Petković. Uh, he traveled late 20s to West Africa, and then he produced a travel book. And in this travel book, there's only one illustration, and it's this map. And I'm a little bit obsessed with maps, as I spoke to some of you, you know that. Uh, he published this map. And this is the map. It's written in Cyrillic, but it's West Africa. It, and if you look, it's very strange perspective. It should be like turned this way. And I don't know. It's not written anywhere. Maybe this is this influence of surrealism or something. But it's a funny uh, looking map. Um, another important Paris encounter happened in 1934. When Peter Guberina, I don't know if you heard of this name, Peter Guberina was a PhD student of linguistic at Sorbonne, and he met Amy Césaire. So they became good friends, and Guberina invited Césaire to his native city of Šibenik. And Šibenik is on the seaside, on the, on the Adriatic coast. So he invites Amy Césaire to Šibenik, and Amy Césaire, <coughs> believe it or not, starts writing his uh, poem, Notebook of a Return to the Native la Land, there. And you probably know better, Amy Césaire, than me, and you know better about this poem as being one of the first expressions of the concept of negritude. So there was another person in that circle, and that was in the circle of friends. That was Leopold Senghor, but I don't have an image of that, who later became a president of Senegal and traveled to Yugoslavia on an official state visit in 1975. So generally speaking, um, Yugoslavia fit well into the discourse of the third world and the non-alignment. Uh, particularly because socialist anti-imperial revolutions had a lot in common with anti-colonial ones, which made the Yugoslav case of emancipation in the context of socialism particularly significant. And it's not a coincidence that the Yugoslav delegation was invited to attend the first Asian socialist conference in Rangoon in Burma in 1953. But of course, the most significant in this relation between Yugoslavia and the Third World was without doubt Yugoslavia's identification with and support of global anti-colonial struggles uh, and its membership in the non-aligned movement. And this also became an important part of the Yugoslav constitution. Um, one uh, project that deals with this issue of solidarity is the case of Stevan Labudovic. This is the project by Mila Turajlic, who is a filmmaker from Belgrade, and Olivier mentioned Stevan Labudovic. Stevan Labudovic was an important uh, cameraman already in the, during the Second World War, and then after the Second War was a t President Tito's cameraman, traveled with him to the non-aligned countries, filmed a very important meetings, events, foreign politicians, and so on. But in the 50s, um, when Yugoslavia is one of the first, if not the first country in the world who openly supports Algeria liberation war, he is sent to Algeria to film there. So we show at the exhibition some of his films and um, uh, archive and, um, and some other uh, visuals that Mila Turajlic uh, 
provided for the exhibition. And you see in, uh, below El Mujahid, um, which was founded, a newspaper founded by the National Liberation Front in Algeria, and it was printed in Belgrade in the form of a book in 1962. So in comparison with uh, colonial narratives, Yugoslavia had never asserted itself as the one who tended to civilize others, which is basically the idea that colonization brings civilization and culture to those who are still at the stage of pre-modernity, but as the one who tended to help the others establish the position in a role that had yet to be created and defined. And this is a so-called older brother paradigm, which of course, from today's perspective, is also problematic. Um, the Yugoslav membership in the non-aligned movement was at uh, the beginning distinctively political. It was a quest for alternative political alliances. And of course, it also had a pragmatic agenda. It soon acquired an economic dimensions and created new spheres of interest and exchange among Yugoslavia and the countries of the non-aligned movement. And Tito traveled to various, Africa, to various African and Asian countries on the so-called journeys of peace on this boat, as you see here, not as a conqueror, but to support the independence of post-colonial states. And there's a little story about this boat. Uh, we have one project at the exhibition about the boat. So the boat, um, it's in 61, fully functioning. Tito's traveling in this boat around the world. And the uh, image next to it is uh, the boat now. It is basically a ruin, and it's in the Croatian port of Rijeka. Um, it's very problematic, uh, this situation, especially in Croatia. They're not very much, they're not very in favor of the old socialist times, including the non-aligned movement. But still, there is this um, initiative to turn the, uh, the boat into the museum, and I hope they will succeed. There's another map of Tito's travels, um, and especially important was the 61 uh, trip to uh, Western Africa, all these travels on that boat that you saw. So when he traveled to Western Africa, he was, of course, meeting various presidents. And that was just before the first meeting of the non-aligned movement. So of course, you can imagine what they were also debating an, among, uh, besides the economic collaboration, but also preparation for the first conference of the non-aligned movement. Um, intense economic collaboration uh, included uh, Yugoslav construction companies working on projects in A Africa and Middle East. So that's one image from a project in Zambia, and you can see President Tito, uh, his wife with the dark sunglasses, uh, Zambian President Kenneth Kaunda, and uh, diplomatic circle. Um, so what, what, what was the importance of these Yugoslav construction companies? They, um, there are some uh, young generation scholars now in former Yugoslavia uh, that research the ways how Yugoslavia and decolonized countries in Africa became unexpected allies in the process of articulation how to be modern by one's own rules. That is how to direct one's own modernization processes. And the construction companies, there is one project. Uh, it is exhibition view. And that's uh, Dubravka Sekolic is a colleague, an uh, architect and researcher. She focuses on this construction company, Energo Projekt, that was very important, one of the biggest one in Yugoslavia, working in 15 non-aligned countries. Uh, building everything from dams, bridges, schools, hotels, uh, you name it. And for example, there is one example from Lagos, Nigeria, <coughs> and the interior view. And that's all done by the uh, Energo Project. Energo Project um, and, of course, this architectural project are important yeah. because architects combine particular as it's called Yugoslav modernism with tropical and international modernism that respected local context. And of course, there's also the other side of it because the Yugoslav constructing companies, usually when there was this international tenders, they gave much lower price than the Western companies. And the Yugoslav companies uh, also provided loans so when you have a very good loan and a very uh, and a smaller uh, price for the project, of course you would uh, choose somebody like that. Um, of course, we 
should also discuss, and we do discuss this within the exhibition, uh, Western European cultural heritage. How this cultural heritage was to be understood in these post-colonial countries. And it was understood in terms of juxtaposition. Um, juxtaposition in a sense that this heritage would be intertwined into the living culture of the colonized and would not simply be a repetition under new political circumstances. And for this reason, local to local approach had been so important. And subsequently in the West, um, non-Western, and non-Western, um, it's a term constructed in the West today, an euphemism, art of the world is frequently used. So non-Western cultural expressions in the West were almost always uh, either inter interpreted as traditional, ethnographic, pre-modern, or something that has yet to catch the Western art canon. And Amy Césaire was quite straight in his writings on colonialism consequences on cultural heritage of the colonized people. The colonial project was not only economic military, but also affected colonized via apparatus of knowledge, and in this way den denigrated their cultural and uh, culture and cultural production. And um, the non-aligned conferences, even though culture was never in the foreground, but they discuss it. And they discuss, among other things, also the question uh, that is a hot topic today, restitution. That was already in the 61. Restitution, cultural imperialism, and so on. Um, we have at the exhibition uh, also cases that are dealing with the topic of colonialism. I will show only one. You probably, uh, people from Belgium, know Sven Augustinian, who's a Belgium artist. Uh, and this is his project from last year, Idiots of All the Countries Unite. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he is taken, uh, he's taken this Europe magazine. I, I don't know, uh, do you know uh, the Europe magazine? That was published in Belgium <laughs> from uh, the 50s until late 60s, but it was very conservative, racist um, uh, magazine uh, uh, supporting this uh, Belgium invasion uh, in the in the newly independent colonial, uh, former colonial countries, and it was supported by the British intelligence services. So uh, Sven Augustinian um, focuses in this project about, of course, the Belgium intervention uh, in, uh, in Congo, especially around the 1961 assassination of Patrice Lumumba. And of course, that's uh, just the installation, you, but of course you can get the idea from just looking at this magazine, how Belgium was actually involved in what was happening in the politics of, in, of Congo, or also after the independence. Um, so, uh, okay, let's go to Congo, uh, or uh, Zaire, as it was called in the 70s, uh, if we are already talking about Congo, um, and to culture and cultural production. Um, there was an ICA. ICA is International Association of Art Critic General Assembly in 1973 in Yugoslavia. And there was an art critic uh, coming from Kinshasa with the name of Celestine Badibanga. And he was very, I found this in the newspaper, and he was very um, straight and very clearly stated that ICA had a problem, and the problem was that ICA has to go beyond the Eurocentric attitudes in art. So his demand for the colonization in art was to be understood in the light of Zairean doctrine of that time called l'authenticité. And l'authenticité is something very strange. Uh, was a doctrine. Uh, it was um, uh, created during the time of the President Mobutu Sese Seko. Um, and this doctrine aimed to erase all traces of Belgian colonialism and art and culture in Zaire. So um, many non-aligned countries, especially in Africa, uh, had used art as a political instrument. And there was during that time, um, and that's really interesting to read, um, many uh, UNESCO produce cultural policy studies written by experts from third world countries with the idea to develop their own cultural models. So you, you can find this on UNESCO's website. 
And l'authenticité was probably one of the most extreme ones. But the point behind all these discussions and cultural politics was to acknowledge cultural diversity without arranging them on a hierarchical scale of civilization and to open up a conversation across differences. So we can reckon this was um, actually a specific internationalism. It was a cross cultural experience of provincialized modernism. And this is something that um, comes from Deepesh Chakrabarti because Deepesh Chakrabarti was uh, talking about um, provincial history, that the history of the West is not the universal history, but there's just many provincial histories in the same way we can understand this provincial modernism construct. So um, even though non-aligned countries were culturally very diverse, the newly established contexts and exchanges provided a fertile uh, ground for debates about the relationship between globally dominant Western culture <laughs> and other cultures. So um, now I mentioned this um, exhibition in Jakarta yesterday, but unfortunately um, we cannot read the participants from Cuba. <laughs> Uh, they were, um, well, I'll say something about this um, exhibition. And that's also the case that's presented uh, at the Southern, uh, Southern Constellation. So in 1995, there is this exhibition organized in Jakarta, in Indonesia, and it's um, under the auspices of the Indonesian President Suharto, a very problematic at that time. But nevertheless, the exhibition that is called Non-Aligned Nations Contemporary Art Exhibition, um, is able to gather all these artists from the non-aligned countries. And the only European country participating is Croatia. And that's 95. And there's a war in Yugoslavia. And Croatia is a newly independent country. And then they are invited. They're not even part of the non-aligned movement, because Yugoslavia is kicked out in the 90s out of the movement. So um, what they do, they uh, invite uh, curators from all these countries with the idea to propose contemporary artists to be presented at this exhibition in Jakarta. Of course, as the Croatian, Croatian curator tells me, she's a friend of mine, they were given no context. They were just asked to select works and send them to Jakarta. So she selected, without knowing what is going to be there, five very um, avant-garde works that she said when they arrived there, she didn't know what to do with that. So, um, but it's an important, in a sense, they um, presented artists from the South, contemporary artists of that time, and at the seminar that was called Unity in Diversity, um, they were tackling concepts such as Southern perspective in art, um, and uh, South as a place of change and solidarity. And the question of contemporary art uh, of the non-aligned countries was discu discussed, and the idea of universalist modernism and linear development in art was rejected. And at that seminar, there were participants like uh, Geta Kapoor, Mary Jane Jacob, T.K. Sabapati from Singapore, Jean Supangat from Indonesia, Guru Daraiji, Apinan Poshyananda, and many others. Um, but from the 1950s uh, in Yugoslavia, um, from the late 50s in Yugoslavia, exchanges of all sorts happened in the fields of arts and education. And uh, to give you this information, uh, students from non-aligned countries came to study in Yugoslavia. And according to some numbers, between the years 61 and 91, there were 40,000 students at the University of Belgrade alone, so that's a huge number. Uh, and museums acquired various artifacts, uh, but these artifacts were acquired mostly as gifts and donation. And in 1977, this museum, that is also presented at the exhibition in Ljubljana, and with that image uh, that also Olivia showed, see there in the corner, so the Museum of African Art opened in 77 as a result of this ideological and political climate. And this museum is supposed to be um, the only anti-colonial African art museum in uh, Europe. Um, the collection they have is based on a donation 
from Zdravko and Veda Pechar, also two important people that Olivia mentioned, who were diplomats in various African countries, but also actively involved in the Algeria, uh, Algeria War of Independence. So uh, I don't know if I have, how much time do I have? Because then I can, uh, I can go a little bit faster. Eight minutes. Oh, okay, so I'll skip that. <laughs> oh my God. So, uh, okay, that's it. And then there is another uh, example of this collaboration uh, also presented at the exhibition. That is um, International Biennial of Graphic Arts. Uh, that happened in Ljubljana, started already in the 50s, but since 61, including many artists, many graphic makers from the third world. And here are some images that I find very nice. Uh, five people putting up one graphic, that's uh, typical. And uh, this after the opening, and this one, uh, because it was not everything that, it was not so great as it was uh, written and various uh, proclamations. Because in reality, I checked all these uh, graphic biennials from the 61 on, and as you see here, uh, the third world the graphics was usually put in the less representative uh, spaces and that probably has to do because they did not, simply did not understand what they were getting from those countries. Because they usually have topics like op art and uh, this kind of direction and uh, figuration and so on that were mostly receiving from these countries were something they didn't get. And Rauschenberg, for example, in 63 got first prize at this biennial. And that's another case, uh -huh, that's what the exhibition looks like with this presentation of uh, graphics. And that's also the case I mentioned a little bit yesterday from a small Slovenian town, north of Slovenia, with the exhibition under the auspices of United Nations, under the auspices of non-aligned movement, and where Jorge Glusberg was a selector in 1975. And this is the view of the Indonesian uh, donation to that museum. So I'll skip that, I'll skip that. Uh, and one important um, institution, actually the only one that was established directly uh, under the auspices of the non-aligned movement is this particular institution that was established in 84 in a town at that time called Titograd, Tito's town, today of course changed name to Podgorica. Um, so with an aim to collect, preserve, and present the arts and cultures of the non-aligned and developing countries. And uh, they decided about this uh, collection at the Harare conference in the 80s. Uh, and they were able to get in uh, this uh, few years of its ex existence over 1,000 works from the non-aligned countries. So they organized exhibitions, they uh, organized symposia, residences, and the works from that collection, they have really a variety of works from the non-aligned countries, including uh, three works from North Korea, which are the silk tapestries, including the very important work of Bangladeshi artist Rafi Kunabi. And this is the view from the Southern Ex uh, Constellation exhibition. And there is the one on the boat. You can see it really well. But it's an artist from Nicaragua, from Solentinam, with the name of Elba Jimenez. And next to it is a work from Bolivia. So uh, OK, I will skip that. So of course, the Yugoslav uh, art historians, the Yugoslav press, uh, they did not understand this collection at all. Uh, it was considered primarily a heritage of other cultures, the only of a kind in the world. So um, it seems there was a lack of understanding in Yugoslavia during the time about such provincialized modernism, especially the lack of more firm position regarding other culture in relation to Western modernism. So uh, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. It seems that, um, yes, this gallery uh, that I just showed uh, before, Unlike Western colonial museums of previous times, acquired art of the world solely as gifts and donation while attempting to develop its own cultural networks and frameworks of knowledge. And it was only in the past decade. This collection is in a depot. You cannot see it. But it is only in the past decade that the collection has started gaining more visibility, especially in this field of study, um, post-Yugoslavian, post-colonial studies. 
So today, uh, that's the conclusion now. Uh, politically speaking, the non-aligned movement is considered predominantly anachronism, <coughs> even though it's still con it has more members than ever, 120 countries. And um, the fate of this constellation is probably one of the least understood phenomena of our times. But it's certain that its disappearance from the world political stage is directly linked to the rise and victory of neoliberalism, especially after 1989. And one of the works at the exhibition is Naim Mohamein's two meetings and a <coughs> funeral deals kind of with this topic, with this um, end of uh, non-aligned utopia, especially after the 1973 uh, conference in Algeria with the oil crisis, with the third world debt crisis, and you can see here in the image, in, it's uh, Vijay Prashat and Samia Zanadi from Algeria. So even though the movement aims were from the beginning progressive, it envisions forms of politics that took as their starting point the life of peoples and society that had been forcibly relegated to the margins of the global economic, political, and cultural system. There were many states in the non-aligned movement that were quite far from the principles the movement promoted. So we also, um, yes, of course, it's important to emphasize that most of the refugees coming to Europe uh, in the past years are from the non-aligned countries, countries that are currently at war or involved in some kind of armed conflict, and we have works dealing with the migration uh, issues, uh, Aya Haidar and a work by Babi, uh, Babi Badalo, uh, a refugee himself. So, um, Mm, we can make a conclusion that the non-aligned movement was a transnational political project with an agenda to provincialize universal history. What our exhibition attempted to show was that there obviously existed a heterogeneous artistic production, a variety of cultural politics, extensive cultural networks which enriched the cultural landscape of the non-aligned movement and enabled the discussion uh, on the meanings of art outside the Western canon. But in spite of all these um, substantial expressions, there were no uh, specific non-aligned movement-related modernism. There were no common tissue that would create a new international narrative in art. It was the non-aligned movement-inspired internationalism that had the most significant importance. And this has probably been one of the movement's main potential, which is largely forgotten today. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, uh, thank you for, for the presentation and also for clarifying a lot of things because they are like, uh, like mushrooms, a lot of research working about non-aligned uh, practices and uh, connecting to art. And also, I think uh, we are, I don't know, I'm looking forward to see the exhibition. And also, it must, it must be difficult in, in the actual state of the time and the position that Tito has in, in actual uh, ex-Yugoslavia territories and within this kind of uh, tendency of um, re revisionist uh, rehabilitation of fascist uh, uh, leadership. So I mean, uh, talking about the non-alignment must be, it is a political <laughs> act, it's clear. And how I would like to, to have a, a comment uh, on, on how it works within the actual landscape. Um, but also, and also think, another thing that I found, well, I found a lot of things interesting, but uh, I was thinking about UNESCO that uh -huh. you were mentioning because it's true that UNESCO had also this ambition of uni universalized culture and also they were actually producing, uh, they had a, a whole program of producing uh, exhibitions for exportation with the reproduction of art world, you know, in a Malraux sense. And uh, they, they, they reproduce uh, paintings all around the world in order to make these this exhibitions travel uh, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, in Africa. Uh, and it became very complicated because uh, someone from Iran was saying, but uh, excuse me, everyone here is, uh, is Western, so <laughs> how can we <laughs> present this in our country? So they had, this, they had this good will, you know, the people of UNESCO that is connected to ICA, because ICA was funded by the UNESCO, and they have this obsession of after the Second World War of trying to create a common language, a common knowledge. And so they, for example, they did this, this repertory of 
of images and they did a kind of uh, vocabulary, art vocabulary, but it was finally, it was Western all the time, you know, I think, and you show very well how there were other initiatives that, that sometimes were compared, but really counting on, on these countries, which UNESCO finally uh, was mm. able to, to do it. So, uh, and well, um, and I like the idea of the non-aligned, if you comment plus in the non-aligned utopia, because it was at the end, actually, really at the end. Um, so these are my, my comments, and we can open, but if you could uh, 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 react, uh, maybe. I could, but this first question that you asked me, it's so difficult. It's <laughs> been an ongoing debate now for well, almost two decades, the question of revisionism, and it very, it very differs differs from one country of the former Yugoslavia to another country, and it differs from what kind of government you have. If you have the government that it's more towards left, of course, all this non-aligned question, all this socialism, all Tito, this is something that is present in the public discourse. But the more south you go, for example, in Croatia, that's already can be a problem because they don't want that in their public discourse. They don't want that kind of exhibition. They don't want to uh, remember the good things of socialism, of the non-alignment. And that's where the historical revisionism is str stronger, where it's more present. Croatia, uh, and also to some degree in Serbia. So it's an ongoing debate, <coughs> and it's especially this uh, questions, if we're talking and looking into art and culture, it's about the monuments to the Second World mm -hmm. War. So if you, there's been a lot of exhibitions, there's been a lot of discussion and text about the Yugoslav partisan monuments, which are this enormous structures usually in public spaces, very abstract, usually. Um, so when you see how these monuments are taken care of in particular region, then you would know what the relation of that region is to the question of the past. It's very simple. I mean, in Croatia, many of those monuments have been destroyed, even on art pieces. I mean, very of very important artists. So, and the second question of UNESCO, of course, you said reproduction, but this is something. Oof, I don't know. I'm not an expert on UNESCO. I was just reading those um, cultural policy reports, which I would recommend to anyone who's interested in these topics, because what happens, they usually ask somebody from a, a country, a particular country, to write about cultural politics, about uh, inspirations for the future, future, uh, future plans, and that is something that gives you this very clear picture of what was going on in the field of culture in this uh, southern hemisphere. Mm, and of course, non-aligned, uh, Yugoslavia sent to the non-aligned uh, places also <coughs> reproduction. They sent to, I know one case, they sent to Addis Abeba in Ethiopia, they sent uh, reproduction <coughs> of uh, frescoes. So <laughs> you had this kind of exhibitions too and uh, rep uh, maquettes and uh, reproductions of architectural um, blueprints and sketches. So I think that at that time, that was a common strategy to send reproduction. We had also in Yugoslavia various didactic exhibitions traveling around mm. that consisted mainly about reproductions of French Impressionists and so on. So mm. I think that was a common thing in mm. the 60s. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, any questions from the public? We can, we can gather some on them. Hey, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And um, since you, you presented this wonderful work of mapping uh, relations and, and um, conventions, <coughs> I was wondering if you also th uh, thought about uh, mapping um, public sculpture uh, in the respective countries of the non-aligned movement, uh, because I was I was just remembering that, for example, in in Mexico City there is a um, a sculpture of uh, Tito. Um, so if if there were some representations of public representations, and maybe if there can be a, a kind of typology of of such public sculptures um, between the representation of leaders or maybe more collective uh, kind of representations? Um, actually, I know of um, <coughs> two cases. 
One, it's in Guyana. In the 70s, there was a public monument to the four leaders of the non-aligned movement, and it's made in a very figurative style, the, uh, the heads of the four leaders. And the one very interesting case that we also presented at the exhibition, but I didn't show the images, is the temporary sculptures, temporary monuments that was placed, that were placed around Belgrade during the time of the first non-aligned conference. They're very um, this abstract, and I was talking to the curator from the Museum of Yugoslavia where the images exist, and the authorship is not known. So this, there were many around the city, and they existed only for a week, and then they removed them. So that's the only two cases that are linked to the non-aligned movement, uh, and they existed in the form of a monument, a public monument. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, Got one question in particular, which is if we understand the non aligned movement as uh, an attempt to create a kind of a cultural network alternative to the to the superpowers of the of the Cold War, uh, can we consider the anti-fascist alliance of the of the 20s and the 30s as a precedent? And I'm thinking, <coughs> in particular, to the memory of the international brigades and the anti anti-fascist cultural. Uh, network of the 30s and during the Spanish Civil War, uh, and in this sense, where the um, the, the cultural elite from Yugoslavia who took part in the in the non-alignment movement, whether several of them or some of them veterans from the international brigades or the all the cultural networks of anti-fascism, because I know for sure for the military in the Popular Army of Yugoslavia there were uh, lots of the generals were former veterans of the international brigades, but I was wondering from the cultural point of view, if, if it was the same. And, uh, just, and just one point of information, because you mentioned that the Yugoslavia is the kind of the, the only European country related to the non-alignment movement. But th there was another major European country, which, which is Spain, which was got this very ambiguous relationship with the non-alignment <coughs> movement. And uh, if I'm not they, wrong, they in 79, it was uh, an invited country, never a member, but uh, an invited they were not member. To the they Liaba, applied, to the but they were, not, they were not accepted, Spain. But, but they were an invited country in La Habana, for sure, in 79, because uh, uh, President Suarez, at the moment of the transition to democracy, he tried to play the card of uh, pressuring the Americans of be, uh, becoming a member of the non alignment movement. So they uh, got this uh, really ambiguous uh, relationship with the, with the non alignment movement. Yes, but they were, you have to distinguish between the members and the guests and observers. So there were other countries in Europe that, were, that had the status of guests or observers, for example, Sweden, Finland, Austria. Uh, that's another case. Uh, and I know about uh, the Spanish case that uh, the invitation was, uh, that the application was sent but it was never accepted because they couldn't accept a uh, state where Franco was still in a position. No, no the, uh, that was after, but before that, I think it was, I don't know when it was sent, but he was still alive. That's I found in some uh, historical books on the non-aligned movement, particularly this Spanish case. And when you ask me about the, um, Oh, let's see, cultural networks, anti-fascist networks. A very important influence in Yugoslavia, post-war Yugoslavia, was the partisan art, partisan culture that was established during the Second World War in Yugoslavia. And there were some, I don't know specifically how many or who, but I know for sure that there were people in these cultural brigades that were part of the international, uh, we call them Spanish fighters, Spanski Borci. And the partisan, how this partisan uh, cultural front worked is, I was talking to Olivia before, and uh, you must know that Yugoslavia was the country that during in the Second World War liberated itself, that is, Yugoslav partisans liberated Yugoslavia and not the Red Army, not the Americans or, or other allies. And how they were liberating the country is they were creating these liberated zones. And in those liberated zones, they had um, also cultural, uh, cultural, rich cultural um, happenings. They had exhibitions, they had theaters, they had uh, even ballet dances. Mm -hmm. Uh, schools, education, uh, book printing, and so on. 
Um, and uh, what is also interesting that the Yugoslav cultural workers were trying to get uh, people, illiterate partisans, not only uh, so they would be able to read and write, but they uh, teach them how to write poetry. So you have another level of that to make them cultural uh, workers themselves. So of course, this is all linked. This is a part of the cultural landscape of the post-war Yugoslavia, very important influence. Uh, well, I was wondering about the, the production of the exhibition and the difficulties that it might have had as there are subjects that are still like very uh, under the t over the table, sorry. And uh, if you work, uh, I guess I'm, I'm just, I just want to know uh, how did you get the, the pieces, if you had like any uh, difficulty with uh, governments or nowadays, like this past and present in the cultural management. Uh, yes. I think this is, that's an important question because when we discuss this, all these beautiful things in exhibition, we have to know that behind this exhibition preparation is a lot of hard work, bureaucracy, fundraising. So we did fundraise for quite some years and finally we were able to get uh, money from uh, within this EU uh, creative culture programs. Mm. Uh, because our government, of course, supports us, but with uh, very small amounts of money. So we did that for a couple of years and uh, fundraised everywhere. So that was one um, difficulty, and the other one was uh, the space. I, I had very uh, little space, about 800 square meters. Of course, I could have added m more works, invited more, uh, project, more people, more institutions. There are many around the world. I know that I couldn't just get uh, everybody who's thinking non-aligned movement. But the way I worked is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I did not select everything myself. But I have this network of people that I work with for a long time. For example, people in Chile, people in, uh, I don't know, Africa, in Ghana, in uh, Southeast Asia. So I have this collaboration with uh, these researchers, with curators, with artists, and I invited them. So we made this exhibition kind of in a sense of the non <laughs> like. Um, so they all came to Ljubljana, and this was also the idea to create this other, say, cultural network. Because usually we collaborate uh, with organizations in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, but we do not have uh, the same way as it was, as I showed you on that map. We don't have uh, any kind of exchanges with the countries uh, from the South anymore, and it's a, a really a pity. with the ministries of foreign affairs of those countries or like any political like uh, influence mm -hmm. or somehow? No, no, not at all. <coughs> I mean, but this is, this is the t uh, specific of Slovenia. We can, uh, we can do that. We have still the autonomy to do this kind of researchers to this kind of exhibition. If you do this exhibition in the South, in Croatia, I don't know mm -hmm. if it would be possible. Could you talk a little bit more about this kind of archive of Tito's photos? I remember an exhibition of Mark Nesh, I think Red Africa, they had also some cliches mm, and it seems so to be very, very big. So I don't know how many, 6,000 if I remember right, or even more. So is everything accessible and how do you have to take these sources or is something restricted and how was it working with this archive? Uh, Museum of Yugoslavia is one of our partners on the in this European project. So I've been collaborating with them for a long time. <laughs> and uh, the curator that worked with me is curator who's in that archive. So the number exact, I don't know, half million, 600,000 images. And it's not a problem to access. Some of it is digitized, but of course you have to ask permission. I think you can search online um, with keywords and find lots of images and then you write to them and they give you permission if you want to, for example, have a presentation. I did that. They have lots, for example, because I was traveling to Korea. I had a presentation about this exhibition and I knew they would be interested in 
North Korea and the non-aligned movement. <laughs> so, so I uh, wrote to this colleague and was able to get enormous amount of images of Tito's visit to Pyongyang and uh, oh. Korean delegation visiting uh, Yugoslavia. So if you have some idea, then of course they, they'll help. Okay. Th thank you, Bojana. I think we, there was any question more because we are already uh, so Super out late, of huh? schedule that is <laughs> crazy how out of schedule we are. But thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.